Thank you. I want you to um, think of a song. Um, and a song that, or any piece of music, in fact, the only uh, requirement is that it really means something to you. It could be um, the song that was played at your wedding, the song that was in the background when you got a slow dance with that girl you really liked uh, when you were at school. Um, it could be something that got you through a hard time. It could be something that makes you want to dance. It could be anything, but it needs to actually speak to you. It needs to mean something to you. Okay? Now I'm going to come back to uh, what I just played and to the song later. But um, before then, I want to talk to you about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is exactly what you think it is. It's been in the news a lot lately, and it's been in popular culture for a long time. And it's simply the idea that, given enough time and enough effort and enough ingenuity and creativity, we might get to the point where you can program a computer so that it's so much like a human that you would actually credit it with having intelligence, creativity, emotion, and everything else that you think uh, is currently only within the realm of humans. And for a long time, that's been purely a science fiction idea. But more recently, there have been some interesting developments, and now people are saying, some people are saying that they think that proper, true AI is just around the corner, that it might happen in our lifetime. Now, that leads them to the idea of something called the singularity, which is the idea that, well, if you can make computers that are so good that they're as good as humans at everything humans can do, then you could probably just say, well, OK, if they're as good as humans, and humans can design artificial intelligences and make them better, then the AIs themselves can do that. And because they're not constrained by our weak flesh and our um, long period that we need in which to reproduce, they'll go steaming off ahead of us and surpass us in all ways possible. And usually when you hear this uh, claim made, it's couched within a kind of dystopian, futuristic um, scenario. So I spend a lot of my professional career um, going to parties, and uh, when someone asked me what I did, instead of saying I'm a computer scientist and either seeing the will to live drained from their face or uh, being asked whether I would fix their PC, um, I would say, well, have you seen Terminator? I'm the guy who's going to make the Terminator, <laughs> baby. And uh, that's kind of a, a, a much more interesting way in which to present computer science. And there have been plenty of other films since then, like The Matrix, for example, that incorporate this idea. Now, it's not something you should take as read that if AI gets achieved, it will actually be bad. It could, in fact, be a really, really good thing for humanity. Because if you can make machines that in some ways are cleverer than we are, you could think of plenty of good uses for them. You could make them do science. They could help design drugs. Okay? There are all manner of things they could do. You could put them to work designing a fusion reactor and have unlimited cheap energy. Okay? There are all manner of things that AI can do that are actually really good. My own group works mostly with biochemists. We use artificial intelligence to help them understand the biochemistry of the cell and how proteins interact inside it. And this has applications in medicine, pharmaceuticals. And so AI could be a genuinely good thing. And it can be used right now, even though it's not at the level of intelligence of a human being. I also think that uh, wiping out other species is a particularly stupid human behavior. And if AIs are that intelligent, they're probably not going to copy us in that respect. So I'm not too worried. But the other reason that I'm not particularly worried is that I think there are incredibly good technical reasons to believe that we won't see human-level artificial intelligence anytime soon. Now, today isn't the time to talk about the technical reasons, so I want to appeal to you on a more human level to try and convince you that artificial intelligence isn't really going to be happening in its full glory anytime soon. Here's a question. Um, 
When I came and played the drums just now, would you have responded in the same way if I'd just played a tape recording? I suspect not. Whenever I hear a human playing music, it gives me the shivers. There's something about that connection uh, that makes all the difference. It makes you know it's a human being involved and there's not a recording, okay? I find that completely changes the experience for me, and I suspect it does for many of you. Possibly the reason for that is that when you see a musician, or even when you just hear one on a recording, there's a communication involved. Now, in the solo I just played for you, I was trying to communicate the fact that I really love drumming. I really love drumming. <laughs> I was trying to communicate, um, in various parts, a sense of rhythm, that sort of communication of making you want to feel a bit dancey. Um, and there was obvious showboating put in there as well, deliberately, because I wanted to establish a communication with you. And that, I think, uh, is one way in which you can demonstrate that music is communication. Now, the reason I think that this is important for artificial intelligence research is that real deep communication is very problematic for artificial intelligence. OK, there have been some really nice uh, advances recently that will, for example, allow you to talk to your mobile phone, ask it a question, and you probably get a decent answer back. But that's not enough. I think, to make you believe that you're actually interacting with an intelligence. I'm going to use an example that I heard in a talk by the philosopher Margaret Bowden. And she had found a line from Macbeth that puts this perfectly. And the line is, sleep but knits up the ragged sleeve of care. That sentence is a nightmare for artificial intelligence. To get a computer to extract from that sentence its full meaning is not something that any researchers in the world are anywhere near. Sleep that knits up the ragged sleeve of care. Well, OK, so we can interpret that. It basically means if you feel lousy, a good sleep might make you feel better. Although, thankfully, Shakespeare didn't put it that way. Sleep that knits up, OK? Knits up is to fix or to make something. Okay? The ragged sleeve, the ragged sleeve is it's not what it should be. It's, it's in some sense incomplete because it's falling apart. The ragged sleeve of care, okay, when you're worried, it sort of feels a bit like that, doesn't it? If you were a sleeve, you'd be falling apart a little bit at the seams and not quite together. So sleep that knits up the ragged sleeve of care is a very complicated sentence. And AI is nowhere near being able to interpret that kind of thing. Now, music is harder I claim, than just the spoken word in artificial intelligence. To communicate something from one person to another purely by music is a long way off. Now, AI researchers have done work on generating music. Okay? I'm not here to put down any of my colleagues. Some of the uh, advances in AI are quite wonderful. But music is still tricky. Now, you can algorithmically generate music. Some people think this is a very good thing. Okay? Sometimes, if you can algorithmically generate music for free, it's just what you want. If you want something for the background in a piece of advertising, perhaps, maybe that's just what you need. But Frank Zappa said something very important about what music is, essentially. Basically, what he says is, you can put a microphone on your throat and gargle carrot juice and record the sound. And that's music, if you call it music. You have made it music by the very simple fact of framing it. You say, that is my composition. That is my music, that sound. And of course, the question then is, is it any good? Now, currently, I would claim that artificial intelligence generating music produces music that is the equivalent of gargled carrot juice. OK? And that brings me back to the song I asked you to think of, the song that speaks to you. My song is Diamonds and Rust, 
by Joan Baez. This is an extraordinary song. In it, she tells the story of receiving a phone call from an old lover unexpectedly. And within the space of a few lines, she paints a picture that anyone who has been in love and broken up with someone and not seen them for a while and then heard from them out of the blue and started to wonder what if things had been different, starts to think about the time that has gone past. If you've had that experience, she encapsulates it for you in a few short lines. Now, I have never met Joan Baez, but when I hear that song, there is a communication passing from her to me. And it's one that only a human could write because only a human has that understanding of what it means to be human and to have been in love and to have lost that love and to wonder whether things could have been different. And that's an extraordinary thing to do in the space of a short song. So, the reason I wanted to play some music for you today and the reason I wanted you to think of the song and the reason I think that this is uh, important for AI, it's all just to make that point. I spend my life working in artificial intelligence, and I think it has the potential to be of tremendous good to humanity. It also has the potential to be very dangerous, but I like to focus on the positive. But despite the claims I hear about how human-level AI is just around the corner, I think, and I think, uh, with considerable conviction that until the day comes that I can listen to a piece of music or a song written by a computer and truly empathize with its creator, humanity is pretty safe. Thank you. <laughs>